and then um, we have plenty of time for discussion. So I think what we should try to do is stick with what the plan was yesterday, which was following into the presentations so that we can confine questions to matters of clarification um, and before weighing in on the philosophical outrage that we feel has <laughs> been perpetrated by the speaker, we could wait to the end and then we can pull our outrage. <laughs> and, although we may we may mischaracterize the shape of it, we'll probably get a stronger signal if we, if we do that. <laughs> so so um, the other thing to say is that when you're um, asking questions, there's no need to come up to the front as I understand, but if you could stand up and broadcast your voice loudly so that one of these microphones picks it up. Is that the idea? That's right. Yeah. So Okay, so we've got um, three talks each uh, time for 45 minutes, and that is, I think, to include some some um, a short period for questions afterwards. Um, and then at the end, hopefully, we'll have time for a discussion, and I'll try to kind of dis structure that discussion a little bit so we don't just kind of go all over the place. We'll try and do it perhaps in kind of chunks that um, try to deal with different issues that seem to be coming up in the course of the, like, in the, course of the morning. So with all of that in mind, we'll get off straight away with the first uh, talk, which is uh, Chris Baker, uh, NIMH. In fact, Chris and I were colleagues. Uh, you will tell me how many years ago? Um, over 10. <laughs> Certainly over 10, more like 15, I think, in, in St. Andrews in Scotland, when I think I was chair of the department and we were working with Dave Perry. That's right. Uh, and we haven't seen each other since. No. <laughs> anyway, over to you, Chris. And uh, the pros and cons of circular inference. Okay, so although I talk about the pros and cons of circular inference, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the cons of circular inference and then come back to the pros at the end because I think it's important for us to understand why people do circular inference. And it's not because they're trying to hide something, it's not because they're trying to sort of cheat the data, it's because people are sort of getting lost in their analyses. And so what I'm gonna try and do is sort of highlight how it comes about, and then maybe at the end we can sort of talk about why is it that people do this and how do we sort of make sure people don't do this in the future. So I want to acknowledge um, my colleagues in this. So what I'm gonna talk about today arose out of discussions that we had over a long period of time with uh, Nico Kriegerskorda, who's now in uh, Cambridge in the UK, Kyle Simmons, and Pat Bolgowan, who are both at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And most of what we're going to talk about today is things that uh, we published earlier this year in a paper in, in Nature Neuroscience, sort of highlighting these, these issues. Where I'm going to go today is, first of all, I'm just going to say, well, what is circular inference? And particularly, I want to say, what is circular inference in the context of fMRI? analysis. How does it come about in that, in that context? And then I'm going to go through a number of different examples to sort of make it clear where this, um, where this comes from. We'll look at sort of an example of a regional activation analysis, a very popular type of analysis people do in fMRI. We'll look at a pop pattern information analysis, um, which is becoming increasingly popular, as well as looking at data sorting. And at the end, I'm going to um, talk about what we propose as a suggested policy for avoiding circular inference. We don't want to be prescriptive when I suggest this, but this is kind of a policy that we, we think if people followed this would prevent these kind of um, errors happening in the literature. So first of all, what is circular inference? Well, circular inference is an inference where you assume the conclusion at the start of your, your process. So for example, you say given A, we're going to test A. Testing A, we're going to conclude A. So it's <laughs> there's nothing really going on here, and obviously this is not what we want to do. And if it was as simple as sort of looking like this, then nobody's going to do this. But in the context of imaging, it starts to creep in. And so why is this? Why does it sort of appear in uh, functional imaging analysis? Well, I think what's really important to remember is that we start out with data. And in functional imaging, we have lots and lots of data. But at the end of the day, what we're going to do is try and summarize this data in some sort of set of results that is hopefully reflecting the data, but is only reflecting sort of part of the data that we may be interested in. Now ideally, the data would lead directly to the results, but this is not exactly how things go because in between data and results, we have analysis. 
an analysis can be very complicated. Now, into the analysis, we generally have a set of assumptions. And it's these assumptions that are going to start causing us the problem. Now, sometimes it's very difficult to un uh, untangle the assumptions of the data. But ideally, what we'd like to see is that the data still directly reflects the results. The results still directly reflect the data. And the assumptions don't affect the results that we're going to get out. But what can happen is that sometimes, in sort of the worst case, the assumptions directly produce the results. This is sort of the worst case scenario, where in fact, what we're presenting in results doesn't reflect the data anymore at all. It reflects the assumptions. And this is what we can think of as being circular inference. Now, this is, as I say, this is sort of the extreme case. I don't think this happens that often. But what's more likely is that the results will reflect both the assumptions and the data. So both of these things are producing the results. In sense, our interpretation of the data is tinged by what our assumptions are. So how do assumptions in fMRI produce circularity? And what I'm going to focus on here is one particular way in which the assumptions that are made in analyses will produce this type of circular inference. And what I'm going to focus on is selection. And selection is generally critical to most of what we do in functional imaging. So selective analysis is a powerful and essential tool. We have lots and lots of data. It's very difficult to make sense of this data. And there are certain aspects of the data we want to focus on and not others. And it's becoming more and more important because we're getting increasingly large data sets. We can't handle these data sets. We need to sort of pass them in particular ways. And one thing that I'm going to make, you know, a comment I'll make here, and I'll make this again throughout the talk, is that this type of analysis is common throughout neuroscience. It's not just something that affects functional imaging. Functional imaging is particularly affected because of the large number of channels that we essentially have, the large number of voxels, the large size of the data set and dimensions. So selection is what I'm going to focus on in terms of um, assumptions producing circularity. Well, when does selection, how does selection produce circularity? And what happens is, is we get circularity when the result statistics that we're calculating are not independent of the criteria used for selection. If, um, and why is this the case? Well, this is the case because when we select from the data, we're selecting based on the true effects in the data plus whatever noise there is in the data. If selection were based only on true effects alone, there'd be no problem. But we have this problem of noise. And so sometimes the noise um, may agree with particular hypotheses that we have. Sometimes it may disagree. And selection in these cases will, will sort of bias the later presentation of the data. And we've referred to this problem as double dipping. And so by double dipping, what we mean is that the same data is used both for selection and for computing the result statistics. And that is when we're going to have these problems of circularity. Now, there are many different types of selection that people can use. So we can have selection that can be some sort of binary selection. Either you, in the context of functional imaging data, you include some voxels or you exclude voxels. Just a binary um, selection. We can have some sort of continuous selection where you're weighting individual voxels, depending on how you include them. Or we can have some sort of sorting where you sort voxels based on the responses and then do some later analyses. All of these different types of selection and other ones that we can use have the potential to produce these kind of, of circular analyses. So examples of selection um, in the case of functional imaging, the sort of the classic example of selection would be um, selecting a region of interest or voxels of interest. This doesn't necessarily have to be as part of like a, a region of interest approach to functional analysis where, for example, you want to identify a particular brain region and then do some later analysis. It may even just be in terms of doing some search. You pick up voxels, some blob in the brain is part of that interest, and then you want to look at that a little bit further. Um, so for example, we may do some sort of um, simple contrast analysis. We're going to look at regions of the brain that are more responsive under condition A than condition B. So we do this contrast across the whole um, volume that we recorded, and you find that there are regions that are more responsive under A than B. And in this case here, I'm assuming that this search here has been done um, and corrected for multiple comparisons. So I'm assuming there's no error in what we've done here. It's not that we're picking up things that maybe aren't there. We're pretty confident that these are real. But if you now use these regions, these are now, we're going to select these regions. And now we're going to look at the data within those regions 
in the same data set, that's where we produce circularity. So for example, if we now go in and say, okay, in these regions, I'm just gonna plot what the response is to A and B. Well, in this case, every voxel you selected responded more to A than B. So of course, this is undeniably gonna be true. This is not providing any additional inference on top of what we had here. Now, of course, you can go further this, and lots of people do, where we can actually produce some sort of measure of error on here. That measure of error is not a real measure of error. It's, um, and then you can go even further, and you could do some, we could do a t-test now to show that, in fact, A is greater than B. So this type of, of plot here, I think, is incredibly common in imaging papers. Now, that's not to say that always when you see a plot like this, it's gonna be, be circular. But this, I think, is, is the sort of thing that we see a lot and it sort of raise, it should raise a lot of red flags. It doesn't mean that the conclusion that this region responds more to A and B is wrong. It's just that it, we can't really interpret this appropriately because it's affected by our prior selection. So this is a distortion of the data because of the selection process that went on here. And I'll come back to this later and hopefully maybe make this a little bit clearer. Now, as I said, what I, in sort of presenting this, I assumed that we did a, an appropriate correction for multiple comparisons. Now, one of the things that um, is, is sort of a little bit more disturbing is when there isn't an appropriate correction of multiple comparisons there, and people are using this type of analysis of the data to sort of independently verify what they may have done here with sort of a low um, threshold. So for what I'm gonna present here, I'm gonna largely assume that we're doing this kind of mapping appropriately but I think things become a lot more complicated if that initial mapping is not done appropriately. Then you have to be much more concerned about the overall conclusions that people are drawing. So this is in, in fMRI, and as I said before, selection doesn't just occur in functional imaging. Selection occurs throughout neuroscience. And so for example, in, in single unit recording, so we're recording the activity of individual neurons, um, one of the classic sort of cases of selection is in uh, in almost every single physiology paper, people will show their typical neuron. And that's an example of selection. Obviously, that neuron was selected because it looked really good. <laughs> and it looks really good maybe because, in fact, the noise may be helping you, maybe making it look better. Um, this is another case of, of sort of a selection bias. We can also do some analysis, say, for example, we record from a whole bunch of neurons, and we're only going to analyze those neurons that are visually responsive. That selection of neurons that's visually responsive is going to affect your later analyses. Or it may be that you select neurons for a particular type of selectivity. For example, they respond more to faces than to other objects. We can also look at selection in the case of sort of EEG and MEG, where we may select sensors or waveforms of interest. Again, this selection can affect later analyses. It can happen in behavioral studies. Um, for example, people do, can do things where they sort participants by performance. For example, we have some sort of training experiment. We'll have the fast learners versus the slow learners. That sort of sorting can affect the later analyses and so in ways that are, are not always um, straightforward. And this can also come up in, for example, in gene microwave where we're selecting subsets of genes. So everything I'm gonna say here can apply to all of these things. But as I said before, the problem is particularly pronounced in um, imaging just because of the large number of units we're selecting, the large number of voxels that we're dealing with. So one of the questions is, well, well how common is this double dipping? And um, you know, we, we were thinking about this problem because we were seeing examples in the literature where we thought people had done analyses that were not quite right, that they were making conclusions that weren't warranted given the data. And in the end, we decided to do sort of a, a, a more thorough review to see, well, how often do we see these types of analyses? How often do we see people using the same data for selection and for then producing some sort of results statistics? And what we did was we looked at all um, functional imaging papers, um, all fMRI papers published in the calendar year 2008 in five journals. And we looked in Nature, Science, Nature Neuroscience, Neuron, and the Journal of Neuroscience. And I think what we, what we, we pulled sort of our, our uh, findings together, it was a little bit surprising because we found that this was actually very common. So out of the 134 papers we identified, we found that 42% contained some sort of, of double dipping analysis, um, which, which is a large number of papers. On top of that, there were 14% where we couldn't tell. There was not enough detail in the paper to know exactly how they did their analysis. And this, I think, is a sort of a separate problem 
we have to be concerned about that people have to report exactly how they analyze their data. And there are certain elements of an analysis that are very important. And I would say this is one of them. And that 14% is, we just have no idea. Now, when we did this, our criteria were simply that the main portion of the paper, excluding all supplementary materials, had to contain at least one um, double dipping analysis. So it's not to say that these papers are just wrong. It's not to say that they're reaching incorrect conclusions. These papers may still be correct in their, in their conclusions, but we, we don't know. The problem with these kind of, um, this kind of bias is it's very difficult to evaluate how much of a bias has been introduced. There may be some cases where, in fact, the conclusion is just not warranted given the data. There may be other cases where, in fact, it's distorted in effect and made it appear larger, but, in fact, the conclusion would still stand. Um, and this is, this is a very sort of difficult problem to deal with. So hopefully this gives you an idea of what I mean by circular inference, particularly in the context of functional imaging analysis. So let me give um, some examples. So the first example I want to give is of a, of a regional activation analysis. And the example I'm going to give here is one that's going to be based on a simulation. So where we can control exactly what is present in the data and see how a circular analysis affects um, the results that we, we, we reach. So we simulated a 3D volume of voxels, 30 by 30 by 20 voxels, and um, 200 time points. We had a, a block design experiment. We had four conditions, A, B, C, and D. And we had a spatial temporal noise, um, so the data is, is um, slightly smooth. And here, this is a portion of the central slice of this simulated data. Now, the true effects in the data are found in this region here, marked in blue. And the effects that we actually placed in here are shown over here. So we have these strong responses to A and B, nothing to C and D. Now we can probe um, this data set using some sort of contrast. So here we use a contrast of A versus D. And we can apply this contrast to our data set here, and what we get is some um, set of voxels that um, fit this contrast. Now the important thing to notice here is this, these voxels we identify here overlap to a large extent to where the true effect is. It's not that we're picking up something that isn't there in the data. There is something in the data here. Uh, the voxels we're selecting are those correct voxels, but what you notice in particular is that we actually, because of the noise in the data, sometimes voxels that are outside where the true effects are will be selected. Voxels that actually are within the true region of interest, uh, the true, where the true effects are, will sometimes not be selected. So it's kind of at the fringes of this ROI where we have sometimes voxels being included or not included depending on the noises in the data. Having done this, if we now plot what the pattern of activation is for those voxels we selected in that same data set, and here again, you just note that this is assuming here we did um, a full correction for multiple comparisons here. If we plot the data, what we get out of that is this pattern here. Now, you can see that this is somewhat like the true effects, but there is a distortion here. And in particular, what you can see now is in this case here, we now have a stronger response to condition A than to condition B. So we have this distortion of the data where, in fact, we've got this elevation of response to condition A, partly because of the contrast. So we selected voxels that tended to have a strong response to A. When the noise agreed with that hypothesis, we had this sort of boost for condition A, which we didn't have for condition B. If you redo this and now do it with independent data, so we'll do it again, and now we've got a, a separate region of interest. Again, you can see it overlaps where the true effects are, but it's not identical. If we're now plotting this but in independent data, what we see is we get a much better reflection of what the true effects are. So even in the case where there are true effects in the data, this sort of um, selection bias is going to distort the data. And in particular, it distorts the data towards the hypothesis. Sorry, I don't mean to, but just to make the point, isn't the, the test run? You should be doing a one-way ANOVA with four levels so that um, you're then identifying in an unbiased way those voxels so which show some kind of sensitivity to the, and so then follow that up with the pairwise contrast. So you, so you can do that, and there are ways to, uh, to, yeah. to get around this. I think what we're doing here is, is something that actually is quite common, that we see, see this, that people are doing this, are doing these types of testing. There are ways to avoid this. But that's the selection exactly. of the wrong test. It's not so much circular inference as, as using the wrong test to, a, to address a question where you have four 
where, where you have four uh, independent variables? Well, it depends. What depends what your what your particular hypothesis is. I mean, it may be in, in a given experiment. It may be that you only really care about A and D. I mean, I think this is this is. So that's a wrong experimental design then. Potentially, but then people sometimes design experiments and look at them in, in ways. Could you go on so we could hear the rest of your yeah. talk? I mean, I think there's, there's definitely ways to avoid this. I mean, this is an illustration to show how the data can get distorted by the selection. Um, so. Sort of one way to think about this is that we have the ground truth and we have the hypothesis. And selection within the same data set is going to sort of mix these two things together. We're going to end up with something that's something of a, of a merging of the truth and the hypothesis. Exactly where it lies along this continuum, we don't really know. But if you're using independent data, then we're going to get closer to the ground truth. So this sort of circular inference is this mixing of the truth and the hypothesis, which, is, which, which can be very dangerous. So in terms of what I'm trying to illustrate here in this regional activation analysis is that this kind of double dipping can produce distortions of the data even when there is a true underlying effect. This is not just about producing an effect where there is none. It's about distorting the data in particular ways according to your selection criteria. So having looked at regional activation analysis, let's have a look at sort of some um, pattern information analysis. Now, what I'm going to present here is, is um, data based on an experiment that Carl Simmons, Alex Martin, and colleagues did a few years ago. And what they were interested in is whether um, regions of the brain that are thought to be particularly involved in object recognition, whether they reflect not just the stimuli that are presented, but the task that is also being performed as well. And so they had subjects um, viewing stimuli where they would either have to respond according to the object category. So in this case, this is just sort of faces versus dogs, but there were, there were more categories. Or, um, and they were either doing um, a decision that was to say whether the, whether the object presented was animate or inanimate, or whether it was pleasant or unpleasant. And so we have some pattern of response in the, in the cortex according to these different conditions. And the question is, is the pattern of response reflecting both um, the category and the task? And so the way that this uh, data was analyzed was to do a split half analysis, which is, which is based on, on the design of, of Haxby and colleagues from a number of years ago. And so first of all, a region of interest was defined. In this particular case, the region of interest was defined by selecting voxels for which any pairwise condition contrast is significant. Then having defined this, this region of interest, um, we then performed a correlation analysis where the data was split in, in, in half. You can think of this as being a training half and a test half of the data. And the activity patterns were compared for the same versus different conditions across the training and test parts of the data. And this can give you some sort of level of, of decoding accuracy. You can use the similarity of the pattern to sort of estimate what was presented in, in pairwise comparisons. And when this analysis was done, we got this great decoding accuracy for both task and stimulus. So this would suggest that, in fact, yes, the pattern of response in these regions of the brain reflects not just the category of stimulus being presented, but also the task that's being performed on those stimuli. However, there was one little problem here. Um, this was the fMRI data, but we actually got exactly the same result when we applied the analysis to um, randomly generated data. So this result is not really reflected. This, this result is produced entirely within noise. But why is this the case? I mean, initially, this was a bit of a puzzle, because it seemed like everything here was OK. Um, the training and test data were independent. So what's the problem? Why is this happening? Well, the problem in this case is that the selection of the voxels to be included in the analysis was done across all of the data. So training and test data combined was used in the selection process, even though then after that, we separated the training and test data. And so as part of that selection, we're selecting voxels that tend to agree between two halves of the data. It's going to inflate um, the decoding accuracy. So if we redo the analysis now, but instead just use half of the data to select voxels, so we can use essentially the training data both to, se to, to select the voxels only, and you redo the analysis of the fMRI data, what you find is, well, we lose all ability to decode the task. We still have ability to decode the stimulus, which agrees with sort of prior reports in the literature, and in fact, the, the, the Haxby paper, 
that this analysis is based on. And now when we go to the randomly generated data, we get what we expect. We're not seeing any effects here. So the, the, um, the important point here is in a pattern information analysis, the test data must not be used in training the classifier, and this is something that, we're, that everybody sort of understands. You can't, you can't train the classifier with your test data. You want independent test data. But what this highlights this sort of maybe more important, less obvious, is that the test data could not be used in defining the region of interest as well. And in this case, this does appear to produce an effect that wasn't there. We apparently saw apparent information about the task that really wasn't there when we did the analysis in a slightly different way. So this is pattern information analysis. So uh, I'm going to give another example here, which is an example using data sorting. So in um, the data I'm going to present here, what we were looking at, we were looking at the heterogeneity within face-selective fusiform gyrus. So there's a region of the cortex that people have found that's responsive more when people are viewing faces than when they're viewing objects. What we're looking at here is, is that region, is, is every, every box in that region, is it face-selective? Is it like on average this face-selectivity? What is going on? Is it heterogeneous or homogeneous? So what we did, we were doing sort of high-resolution imaging. This is one millimeter isotropic voxels. We had four conditions where subjects were seeing faces, animals, cars, or sculptures. And what we initially did was within our region of interest in the fusiform gyrus, we identified voxels that responded most to the faces, to the animals, to the cars, or to the sculptures. And then we plotted the response um, in those sets of voxels. And so what you see here is we have face voxels that respond very strongly to faces, animal voxels strongly to animals, these ones to cars, and these ones to sculptures. And you could conclude based on this, well, there's heterogeneity within this region. We call it face selective, but it may be on average face selective. Maybe it has voxels that are doing other things. But the problem again here is this is, this is not independent. This is the same data that was used for the selection. If instead we now use um, independent data for the selection and for looking at the pattern of response, we see something completely different. And in fact, this, this pattern here is almost completely abolished. Everything tends to look like it responds slightly more to faces than other things. And you can illustrate the problem here even, even more clearly by taking a region of interest that is essentially just noise. It's not in the brain. If I do the same analysis, and this is just data from one subject, I can select those voxels. If I do it in the non-dependent data set, of course, voxels are selected because they respond in more to faces, respond more to faces. And the same for the other sets. But now if you do that in the independent case, what you see is this is now, is now flat. So again, here, the data sorting that we were doing, the selection that we were doing, can lead you to make um, conclusions that are not um, a true reflection of the data. So in data sorting, again, the criteria for sorting must be independent of the data used to quantify the effects. Now, I said I was going to give three examples, but I'm actually going to give a fourth one. And this is really just to refer to the, um, what I'm sure lots of you are aware of, the Voodoo Correlations paper, which ended up being retitled, The Puzzlingly High Correlations in fMRI Studies of Emotion, Personality, and Social Cognition. Um, so this paper by, by Ed Vool and colleagues, what they highlighted was that in studies where people were doing um, brain behavior correlations, so looking for regions of the brain that showed a strong correlation with behavior, the correlations that were actually reported um, tend to be very high. And the problem here, I think, is the same sort of problem. If you select voxels because they're correlated, the actual, your estimate of the degree of correlation, if you're using the same data, is going to be inflated. That doesn't mean that region doesn't show correlation. It just means that your estimate of the strength of that effect is not valid. That is assuming that the multiple comparisons issue was done appropriately. So sort of having looked at these examples and having seen the prevalence of this in the literature, we thought about, well, how do we, how do we think about this? How should we do analysis? What's the best way to think about it? And so we came up with, a, with sort of a simple policy that um, sort of helps avoid making these errors. So the first question that you need to ask is, is a selective analysis needed? A selective analysis is not always needed. It depends on what your question is. If you don't need a selective analysis, well, don't do it. <laughs> Just do a non-selective analysis. You can just do some whole, some whole brain mapping. That may be sufficient to answer your question. However, if you have a question where you do need a selective analysis, 
Well then, for you need to ask whether the result statistics are going to be independent of the selection criteria. Now, if your selective analysis is based on, say, an anatomical criterion, you're interested in, say, what's happening in the amygdala, you can select the amygdala based on anatomical grounds that's completely independent of your functional data, in which case you can go ahead and do an independent analysis using all of the data. However, if this isn't true, then what we suggested as a way to deal with this is to divide the data into independent sets. And you use part of your data for selection and part of your data for sort of calculating your result statistics. And so you can do some sort of independent split data analysis. This can be done in a number of different ways. You can split your data in half. You can do some sort of cost validation approach. There are a number of ways to deal with this, but the important thing is to make sure that selection is always kept independent from the calculation of the result statistics. Now, if you can't divide the data into independent sets, there's still other options, though I think these are sort of where it becomes very tricky. So in principle, you can model the effect of selection under the null hypothesis. And this is, this is sort of a fine way to go, except it's really complicated to do that. And I think it's probably better if people avoid trying to do that because they may be as, as likely to make an error in modeling the effect of selection as anything else. So for us, we propose doing independent um, testing as kind of like, this is a simple thing to do, it's difficult to do it wrong, and anybody can do that, as opposed to sort of advocating this approach. Well, that, that's, that's sort of one, one type of approach there. I mean, you can, you can go ahead and do that, but it's exactly how to go ahead and do that, I think, is sort of tricky. And so I think for a lot of people, that's not something you should be trying. <laughs> um, sort of a final approach, which I think should be the last result, although in some cases it may be a useful thing to do, is to <laughs> acknowledge the circular results. There may be cases where um, you don't care. You, you've, you've selected the data on some criteria, and it may have produced some sort of bias in one particular part of your results. But that's not relevant for what you're doing, in which case you can just say, this comparison here is circular. You shouldn't pay attention to this, but it may not affect other parts of the data. But I think this is kind of like a last resort. And probably, although I, I don't think there are some cases right now where I think people have, have done this in the literature. I've seen people who sort of um, plotted their data and then put this in. And, and partly, actually, the reason they've done this is because Reviewers have asked them to do the circular analysis. <laughs> and we'll come back to that in a, in a second. So this leads us to the question of why is this so prevalent? I mean, I hope that as I'm presenting this, it seems kind of obvious. Right? There's nothing new statistically. I'm not sort of saying anything that people aren't already really aware of. It's just how it creeps into the types of analyses that people are doing. So why is it so prevalent? Why are people um, not seeing the problem? Well. You know, circular inference is highly sensitive. You don't need as much data as if you're going to do some independent test. Apparently, it's widely accepted because reviewers are not picking up on this. Um, and the results look better. And the point that I want to make here, but saying the results look better, is, you know, what I've sometimes seen is that people present a circular analysis in the main paper and then do a control analysis to show that those results weren't produced by the bias in selection. Well, that's just wrong. I, th <laughs> I think. You know, the independent, analysis of the independent analysis will not look as good because you're not, you haven't got this bias in there. But that's the analysis that should be reported. Um, and, you know, it confirms your results. And what I mean by this is I, I think what sometimes happens is people do their mapping and they want to sort of, I don't know, make sure that it's right. And they plot the data and they put the error bars on. And I think implicitly, and I think this happens when people are reading papers as well, that's seen as like confirmation of the mapping approach. I think people are generally still a little bit susceptible of mapping and a little bit concerned about correcting for multiple comparisons. And I think sometimes people sort of like to see these bar charts or time courses. You can do all these things. They look, they look nice. But um, they're not necessarily confirming the results if it's the same data that was used. And this is sort of falls into this one. I think there is a little bit of pressure not just to show data as parametric maps. And partly, I think this is, is sort of where other fields in neuroscience are sort of putting pressure on. It's like if you show bar charts, you show time courses, it looks like you know, neurons firing, it looks like single unit data, it seems more physiological, it seems more real. Parametric maps, you know, it's the, it's the criticism that says this is like phrenology. You're picking up a spot in the brain. Well, there's, there's nothing wrong with this approach, 
but you shouldn't go ahead and start doing things to try and make the data look different when in fact it's not providing any additional inference on top of the, the parametric mapping. So one of the things that uh, was raised yesterday was the idea of whether we should have optimism or pessimism or perhaps realism. And I think you know, what I'm highlighting here is there are sort of issues in the analysis of functional imaging data that can produce incorrect conclusions, incorrect inference. That's not to say that the approach in itself is broken. If um, I think we can have optimism, but we need to have a critical eye. And there are a lot of results out there in the literature that I think need to be re-looked at um, because there are problems, um, circular inference problems. And um, if we take these things into account, if we're very critical in reading what we're doing, we can get beyond this. We can do the correct inference. There's a lot of power in what we can do with functional imaging, but we have to take the right approach. And it's, it's important to point out when the approach is wrong, but just because there is sometimes the wrong approach doesn't mean that we should sort of put functional imaging aside. And so, you know, this may be what uh, you're referring to as like realism. It's like we can't ignore the problems, but I think we also have to be careful that we don't use those problems to sort of tar the whole um, approach that we're using. So the take home message um, of what I've been presenting today is that selection can lead to circular inference. It's this selective analysis that we have to be very careful about. And that selection and result statistics should be independent under the null hypothesis. And they can be inherently independent because the selection criteria is based on anatomical grounds, not on functional grounds, or they can be computer independent data. These are both two approaches that are perfectly valid. Um, and what we've been advocating is kind of the idea of zero tolerance. That even if it's the case, that it doesn't really matter. You know, in one sense, replotting your data, taking your region of interest and just plotting those bars. You don't have to put errors on, you don't have to do a t-test, you can just plot those bars. That's still somewhat circular, there's still some sort of, you can say, well, there's no inference going on there. But people reading the paper are making an inference, even if it's just a visual inference. In fact, those, the, sort of the magnitude of those effects is distorted. And so what we've been trying to advocate is the idea that we should just not allow this type of approach. We should have a zero tolerance policy towards um, the selective analysis, that you should not use the same data for selection and for producing any sort of um, statistic, even if it just means on that data. Thank you. Will this kind of a double dipping effect still occur with, with those techniques? So is it possible you need to combine the two techniques, two different lead techniques, to explain your data more completely? I think, I mean, I think the problem applies to all of these different techniques. I think combining the techniques doesn't necessarily, doesn't, won't necessarily help. In, in whatever technique you're using, you need to make sure that there's no selection <coughs> and sort of production of of statistics on those, on those data. Um, for example, you could, if you could use two independent techniques, so you could repeat your experiment twice, but if you're making circular inference in both cases, they may agree with each other, but they're still both wrong. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's inherent in the, any, any particular technique, it's a, it's a matter about how you go about the analysis um, so in any so of those cases. Can you please give us an example about uh, how this kind of uh, uh, circular interference happen with uh, human patient data? Or Data. I mean, the, because the data analysis uh, seems to me is really different. Yeah. So human patient data, I yeah, think. Like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, visual movement area, BWFA, uh, so the lesion that you cannot recognize words. Right, well, yeah. so the one thing that can come up, and I think this is partly something sort of Bill mentioned yesterday, is like the issue of HM. HM was part of a much larger study. You have, by focusing on one particular person who showed very positive effects, that's a form of, of selection bias. So it may be the case, I mean, if you tested, you know, I don't know, if you test 10 patients and lesion this region that you think is a word, visual word form area, and then in every single case it works out, that's, that's good. But if it's the case that you're sort of focusing on a case study because it produced a particular striking effect, that's a kind of selection 
um, by it because you're selecting the one positive result. Whether that really reflects the, the effect of a lesion in a particular area or not, you don't know. So, so you have to be careful. One example of that that's come up in the amnesia literature is whether you select your amnesics by referral because they have a memory problem. Right. Or whether you select people to study for a memory deficit because they have a lesion to a particular region. They give different answers. So depending on how your patients enter into your study, whether it's... So you could say an, an incredible selection bias is to say hippocampus causes a memory disturbance. Because everyone who's referred to me with a memory disturbance has damage to the hippocampus. Yes. It's actually <laughs> a completely false um, yeah. a set of reasoning, but it happens. Yeah. So I think that's an example. I wonder if there's a general uh, principle that you can articulate and state, because it seems to me that there's a great deal of science that uh, violates, apparently, superficially at least, uh, what seems to be the principle here, uh, and uh, does so publicly necessarily. So if you're uh, running a <coughs> physics experiment, uh, you expect regular results, you calibrate your machine, you tune it, you do pilot studies, and you use the data where things are running nicely. And it's essentially a selection bias, yeah? Uh, on the other hand, if you didn't, uh, we would have little physical science or else a lot of crap. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, uh, this is not an objection to your example, but I am, I'm wondering about what's the general principle for sorting good from bad here. Yeah. So I mean, I, I mean, in most of these cases, idea you want to sort of, in some sense, you want to randomly sample your data. You want to sort of take that. That's the ideal approach. But as you point out, there's, there's are cases where, in fact, that's not possible. I think the key thing to remember is that whenever you're only analyzing a subset of your data, whether it's because you're throwing out data because you think the machine wasn't working or not, you have to think very carefully about what the impact is of throwing that data out. Um, whether in fact you're, you know, whether in fact it's really appropriate to throw that out and what impact that selection is having on the later data. I mean, I think it, you know, trying, it's sort of, so the general principle is, is really whenever you're selecting subsets of whatever data you have for further analysis, you have to think very carefully about <coughs> that selection process and what effect that has on your null hypothesis. So, so then would you entertain a revision of your zero tolerance principle, namely that, uh, papers ought to have an explicit section discussing impacts of selection bias. So I think, so here in this case, for the functional imaging, we're advocating zero tolerance. But as I pointed out in my sort of, the policy that I presented, there are alternatives for doing this. You don't have to do sort of, you can, you can try and model the effect of your selection. And so that is okay, I think, but the safer thing is because maybe, you know, we, maybe the, the, it's not always obvious to understand exactly how the selection impact your later data, the best thing to do is to try and keep things independent. So in the case of functional imaging, I'm really advocating zero tolerance. There are other approaches that people can do, but you have to demonstrate that your selection does not affect your later conclusions. And I think that's important, that people should have to justify why they selected a portion of the data set over others and evaluate what the effect of that is on their later analysis. I mean, we have the same criteria in physics, it's just, it's very hard to make precise. Okay, I think um, we're going to come into areas that we're going to I'm sure we discuss at the end here. Um, say thanks once again, Chris. I apologise for interrupting, but that's okay. <laughs> I spend a lot of time trying to persuade people when I'm reviewing. Right. But maybe they should expand their analytic techniques beyond the details. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the example you were giving was a classic example where and, and I think. From Right, which is certainly, but it's certainly there. But anyway.